from a troubled childhood of control and power to becoming the second longest reigning monarch in history, Queen Victoria is indeed a queen who owned the 19th century. Her harsh life as a young princess came to be far from her life as a young queen. This era saw massive change and was indeed named after her, the Victorian era. Throughout the period, when we think about the 19th century, who we really think about is one central figure, and that is, of course, the woman who gave her name to the age, Queen Victoria. The 19th century is one of those centuries of enormous change. Britain in 1800 was a hugely different place to Britain in 1900. Britain had undergone the Industrial Revolution, so it had gone from a still largely farming economy to one that was manufacturing on an enormous scale. Cities had grown enormously, particularly big industrial centres. It was also a period that really saw the peak of the British Empire. It was said by the end of Victoria's reign that the sun never set on the British Empire, and that was largely true. If you look at maps of the world in Victoria's reign, large parts of it are coloured pink to show the British Empire. So it was a period of huge change, but it was also a period of hardship, of difficulty, although there were social changes made in the period. For example, it became compulsory for children to attend school. Checks were put on child labour, for example. Women's rights increased to some extent in the Victorian period, particularly in relation to the custody of children and the ownership of their own property. But in general, if you were poor, it was a hard time to live throughout the 19th century. There was very little poor relief. If you were destitute, you went to the workhouse. And of course, we all, when we think about the workhouse, we think about Oliver Twist being fed gruel. But actually, it's, it was a largely unpleasant experience. People would do almost anything to avoid having to go to the workhouse. And it really was when you're at your absolute lowest. Mortality rates were very, very high, particularly among children. Um, death and disease was rife again in the cities. It was a time of great innovation. It was a time of great learning. You know, this is where we have Charles Darwin. We have some great Victorian novelists. We have Charles Dickens. We have William Thackeray. But it also is a time of great hardship. But throughout the period, when we think about the 19th century, who we really think about is one central figure, and that is, of course, the woman who gave her name to the age, Queen Victoria. Businessmen saw how these inventions could be used to increase trade. All over the country, they built factories fitted up with the new machinery. More and more people were needed to work in the factories. Rapid increase in population and the growth of trade made a new postal system necessary. Coming from a troubled childhood, Victoria never thought she could positively influence the world around her in which she has today. Her reign saw enormous changes in human and civil rights. It is a period in which many events, ranging from child labor to slavery, were completely demolished. Queen Victoria, although she was born a princess and a likely successor to the throne, had a very sad and, as she described it, melancholy childhood. She was born to Edward, Duke of Kent, the fourth son of George III, and his wife, Victoire of Saxe-Coburg. And before she was one year old, her father, who had been very, very fond of his baby daughter, died, leaving Victoria fatherless. She was to all intents and purposes an only child. Her mother was a widow, but her older children were much, much older than Victoria. And Victoria also wasn't able to mix freely with other children. Throughout her childhood, Victoria lived in Kensington Palace. She described her childhood as melancholy, 
Her father had passed away just before she turned one. Victoria's mother had then developed a dependable relationship with another man, Sir John Conroy, who had very much controlled Victoria, leaving her feeling isolated and very much alone. Victoria's mother, the Duchess of Kent, very much fell under the influence of Sir John Conroy, who had been an equerry to the Duke of Kent and very much guided the household. He was in charge of Victoria's childhood household. The Duchess of Kent adored him. There were rumors that they were lovers, probably unfounded, but certainly she had a very intense and dependent relationship with Conroy. Victoria despised John Conroy. He was often quite aggressive with her. He really didn't stand on ceremony. In fact, she later marveled at why he had dared so much. And actually, it appears that he believed that his own wife was an illegitimate daughter of the Duke of Kent and thus Victoria's half-sister. And that's why he felt he could take such control in the household. But Victoria absolutely loathed him and by association, her mother. And the Duchess and Conroy very much wanted to control Victoria. Her mother and Sir John Conroy had created the Kensington system. This system was designed to control every aspect of Victoria's life. It was a strict set of rules that made sure she was kept in the hands of her mother and Conroy. Conroy's intention was to weaken Victoria to the point that she would become dependent on him so that he held the real power in the palace. He used Victoria's mother as a guiding hand to this, and she fell very much under his influence. Sir John Conroy was a British army officer who served to Victoria's mother and her young daughter, Princess Victoria. The young Victoria was never allowed to be away from her mother, her tutor, or her governess. These were Baroness Lazen and the Duchess of Northumberland. She fell very much under the trap of the Kensington system, which isolated her from mixing with other children and had completely taken over her childhood. The young Victoria was only five years old when her education began. She was third in line to the throne at the time, and so it was absolutely vital that she was well-educated. Having said this, her mother made sure that she was given a very liberal education in music, drawing, history, and foreign languages. Reverend George Days, her first teacher, who was the Dean of Chester, had instructed her on scripture. Her mother had set a strict daily schedule for Victoria, which had morning lessons beginning at 9.30 sharp with a break at 11.30. Lessons would then resume at three in the afternoon and would continue until 5 p.m. Victoria's mother would then drill her daughter after each lesson. As time went on, she was more and more drawn to hate her mother. She had hoped that her mother would allow her the freedom in which she never came to see, until she became queen. Victoria's uncle, William IV, became king in June 1830. However, he did not have any legitimate children who could inherit the throne on his death. At 64, he was then the oldest person to ascend the throne. Prince Edward, his next younger brother, had died in 1820, and so the next person in line to the throne was Edward's 11-year-old daughter, Princess Victoria. Therefore, a law had to be made in order to provide for the government in the case that Victoria was to be made queen whilst under the age of 18. This is known as the Regency Act 1830, 
which was a law designed to cater for Victoria in the event in which she was still a minor. Her mother would then take over until Victoria was legally allowed to be queen. Conroy and her mother wanted this regency. They wanted to obtain this power and influence and reign on behalf of Victoria. In this sense, it was important to the two that she was kept under an elaborate set of rules, the Kensington system. They knew, particularly as the years passed, that she was very likely to become queen, as it became clear that her uncle, William IV, wasn't going to produce a surviving child. Conroy and the Duchess of Kent wanted the regency. They wanted to rule on behalf of Victoria. And as part of that, they wanted to keep her quite childlike. Um, so she was dependent on them. There was an incident at Ramsgate when she was very, very ill, where John Conroy tried to force her to appoint him as her secretary, something that would have placed him in a very important position in her government. The Duchess of Kent and Conroy kept Victoria isolated. At one point, they wouldn't even allow her to attend a ball that had been arranged in her honour by Queen Adelaide. She was kept away from the royal family, something that William IV very much and very publicly objected to. She wasn't allowed any playmates. The only children she could spend time with were Conroy's own daughters, who she loathed. And she was also given a very strict education the Kensington system, which was designed to raise a future queen, but also to keep her young and to keep her childlike. We know that Victoria was actually forced to keep an account of her own behavior. She had a conduct book where she would write how she behaved, often saying naughty, sometimes very naughty, and underlining it. One, one occasion she writes very, very horribly naughty, um, which suggested not been a good day. It was intended to ensure that she was never alone. If she wanted to walk downstairs, she had to hold somebody's hand. She slept with her mother. She was watched constantly, largely by people who were favorable to Sir John Conroy and reporting back on her. It was not a happy childhood, but it's a very strict, very cloying system, and one that didn't have the desired effect because rather than keeping, creating a childlike, dependent queen, it actually created a woman who is determined to be independent. Really, the only person Victoria felt she could entirely rely on was her governess, Baroness Lazen, who very much was on her side and did push back against the Duchess and Conroy. But it was a secluded, quite sad childhood for Victoria. In fact, she wasn't even allowed to sleep alone. She shared her mother's bedroom right up until her accession to the throne. Baroness Lazen was one of Victoria's tutors during her education. She disapproved of the way that Victoria was being treated. She was, in that case, strongly protective of Victoria and encouraged Victoria to be strong, informed, and independent from her mother's and Conroy's influence. Victoria's uncles also saw the faults in the Kensington system and so when attempts were made to rid Lazen from the royal household, these were made to be unsuccessful. Victoria was seen to be treated very unfairly, and this had taken a toll on her tutor, who wanted to see Victoria happy. Swaying away from her mother's demands of a very liberal education, Lazen had started educating Victoria in decorum reading and writing. She also studied Greek, Latin, Italian, French, and German. Lazen had educated the young Victoria in the thought of her becoming queen. She was dedicated to see Victoria become queen and did her utmost best to make her intelligent and strong-minded. Lazen, therefore, was a major influence on Victoria's character giving her the strength of will to survive her troubled childhood and life as a young queen. She was the only person throughout her childhood who had Victoria's best interests at heart. Victoria had kept a journal from the age of 13 up until her death in 1901. 
we are able to see a glimpse into her thoughts and feelings because of this journal. Victoria wrote about Lazen, the most affectionate, devoted, attached, and disinterested friend I have, suggesting that Lazen indeed was someone she could rely on. On William IV's death in 1837, Princess Victoria became queen at the age of 18. A regency was therefore avoided. Her extremely poor childhood was more than enough for the now Queen Victoria to declare that Conroy be banned from the court and that her mother lived elsewhere. When finding out that she was now queen, she writes in her journal expressing just how nervous she is, saying, I always felt nervous, and Lord M. Melbourne said that no one ever got over that and that there were very few who didn't feel the same nervousness before making a speech, even if you had done it a hundred times. Queen Victoria was, of course, very young when she became queen. She just turned 18, so she had only just stopped needing a regent and was able to rule as an adult. As a teenage queen, her first emotion was one of freedom. She was pleased to rid herself of her mother and of Sir John Conroy, and she very much set out to enjoy herself as queen. The first year or so of her reign, she was out dancing into the night. She enjoyed herself immensely. She certainly was in no rush to get married. But she also found the task of governing quite daunting because she'd gone from being effectively a schoolgirl, kept closeted away. She had barely been to the royal court to suddenly being the monarch, being the queen of Britain. She had to see her ministers. She had to attend the Privy Council. It was a huge learning curve for an 18-year-old. Um, she certainly felt unprepared. She certainly felt nervous. The coronation of Queen Victoria took place on the 28th of June, 1838, at the age of 19. On the morning of her coronation, she writes, I was awoke at four o'clock by the guns in the park and could not get much sleep afterwards on account of the noise of the people, bands, etc. Got up at seven, feeling strong and well. The park presented a curious spectacle. Crowds of people up to Constitution Hill, soldiers, bands, etc. Although it was a big day for the new queen, it was a ceremony that was far from perfect. The ceremony had suffered from lack of rehearsal and only lasted five hours. This led to her coronation being well underprepared. Victoria's coronation was intended to be a glorious state occasion, although it didn't always go as well as it could have done. She was very, very nervous, and in fact recorded in her journal that she'd been woken up by a gun salute to her. She then readied herself for her coronation, and I mean, it must have been an absolute spectacle as she set out from Buckingham Palace. The crowds were enormous and cheering. You know, she was very, very popular when she first came to the throne. People had actually climbed trees so they could get a better look at her. In the Abbey, she was very, very nervous. She hadn't really rehearsed. In fact, no one had really rehearsed and no one seemed to know exactly what to do. When she turned to people for advice, um, people couldn't really tell her what to do. But she made the best of it. But there were some mishaps. Her coronation ring was forced onto the wrong finger. And after the ceremony, she actually had to soak her hand in ice for half an hour to try and get it off. When she received the homage of the Lords, 
And she was obviously sitting on her throne up some stairs and actually Lord Roll, elderly Lord Roll, tripped and fell, rolling all the way down the steps. But Victoria really won approval when instead of just sitting there and waiting for him to pick herself up, she actually got up from her seat, walked down so that he could kiss her hand without having to attempt the stairs again. This tells us a lot about Victoria's character, despite the childhood she had had. She wanted to be the kind-hearted woman that she never had as a child. Victoria writes about her coronation feeling proud. She was extremely blown away by the support around her on this big day. It was a fine day, and the crowds of people exceeded what I have ever seen. Many as there were the day I went to the city, it was nothing, nothing to the multitudes, the millions of my loyal subjects who were assembled in every spot to witness the procession. It was an overwhelming occasion, but she acquitted herself incredibly well. She was clearly very, very stressed. She had a headache when she returned home, and actually the first thing she did when she returned home was bathe her dog. Victoria's relationship with her mother changed as soon as she became queen. Until that point, she had been subject to her mother. And although she railed against it and did attempt to free herself to some extent, she was forced to share a room with her mother. She was forced largely to do what her mother said. Um, she'd even been forced to write to the king to turn down his offer of her own household and her own allowance because her mother didn't want it. As soon as Victoria became queen, the tables very much turned. The Duchess of Kent was no longer the mistress of the household. Victoria, the queen, was. And one of her first actions as queen was to order her bed to be removed from her mother's chamber. After that, she slept alone. As an unmarried queen, a teenager, Victoria still needed a chaperone. She couldn't decently leave her mother behind. It certainly would have set tongues wagging. So when she moved to Buckingham Palace, she was forced to take her mother with her, but she kept her isolated from her. The Duchess of Kent was given a suite of rooms as far from Victoria's as possible. And in fact, she even needed to make an appointment with, to see her own daughter. Victoria would sometimes send a message back just saying busy. It was a very, very difficult relationship. When she became engaged, Victoria didn't even inform her mother for several weeks. It was really only years later that they came to reconcile. Queen Victoria was influenced by two men in the early part of her reign, the first of which was Lord Melbourne. Lord Melbourne was Prime Minister when Victoria became Queen. Melbourne was 58 and a widower. His only child had sadly died, and he therefore treated Victoria like his own daughter. Queen Victoria grew to be very fond of Melbourne and became dependent on him for political advice. Melbourne wanted to protect Victoria from the harsh realities of British life. She grew to be quite close to Melbourne, and Melbourne is said to have spent six hours a day with the Queen. She kept an account of how she felt about Melbourne, once writing, He is such an honest, good, kind-hearted man and is my friend. I know it. It is also said that she loved listening to him talk. Such stories of knowledge, such a wonderful memory. He knows about everybody and everything, who they were and what they did. He has such a kind and agreeable manner. He does me the world of good. However, this close relationship raised alarms in the public and she would get shouted at as Mrs. Melbourne. A rumor had started that Victoria was considering marrying Lord Melbourne. Melbourne was a man who Victoria could rely on and therefore saw him as a father figure she wished she had had many years prior. Thank you.
Lord Melbourne was Victoria's first Prime Minister and it was expected that she would have almost daily meetings with him because of course she was the head of state and was expected to play a role in the government. She couldn't remember her own father and apart from her uncle Leopold, she had very few male figures in her life that she trusted. She certainly didn't trust Sir John Conroy who had effectively stepped into the role of stepfather to some extent. With Lord Melbourne, Victoria found a father figure and he also had had a very tragic personal life and had lost his wife and only child and seems to have felt affectionate, quite fatherly towards her. She saw him as a father figure, she saw him as a mentor. She probably also had a crush on him and he was quite good looking and quite urbane, very charming. And he molded her early character as queen. It was Melbourne who showed Victoria how to be the queen. Not always to good effect in that, of course, he was a Whig. He was from the political party of the Whigs. He very much taught her to dislike and to be wary of Tories, his political opponents. And this did cause problems. Because of course, as a constitutional monarch, Victoria was supposed to be above party politics. But she was so devoted to Lord Melbourne that she was even prepared to bring down a Tory government if it meant that she got to keep Lord Melbourne with her. The second man who Victoria grew highly fond of was her soon-to-be husband, Albert, in 1836. Albert and Victoria were first cousins who shared a set of grandparents. Victoria's mother and Prince Albert's father were actually brother and sister. They also shared other similarities, such as being born in the same year and the same midwife delivering both children. He was a highly educated man and was very keen in the arts, science, trade, and industry. Albert and Victoria first met at Victoria's 17th birthday in April 1836, before she became queen. They were introduced by their uncle Leopold I King of the Belgians. Victoria writes in her journal about how she instantly fell in love. He is extremely handsome. His hair is about the same color as mine. His eyes are large and blue, and he has a beautiful nose and a very sweet mouth with fine teeth. Albert would of course become the love of Victoria's life and absolutely the focus of her devotion. He was her first cousin. Her mother and his father were brother and sister and their mutual uncle, Leopold, had molded Albert as a potential consort for Victoria. Although Victoria probably wasn't aware of it, there was always a plan in the family that Albert would marry her and guide her queenship. Albert came from Saxe Coburg, which was a small German duchy. He had a troubled family life. His father and mother were completely ill-suited. Both took lovers and his father had then divorced his mother and um, taken custody of the son. So Albert was banned from seeing his mother. So he'd had a very troubled family life. He first met Victoria when they were both teenagers before she became queen. He came to her birthday ball. And actually, she wasn't that impressed with him. Her journal talks about the arrival of cousin Albert and his brother Ernest, but actually, he seems to have been quite a sickly character, not much fun. He actually retired from the ball early because he felt unwell. So he really didn't make much impression on Victoria. Certainly, she didn't bother to invite either Albert or his brother to her coronation, although his father was invited. Over time, they started to write to each other in German and had developed a mutual affection for one another. Victoria and Albert were both fluent in German and they tended to communicate in that language. Their letters were affectionate, but they show his dominance. Um, he would write to her as dear child, for example, whereas she sometimes referred to him as her lord and master. Their correspondence very much shows his attempts to 
dominate the relationship, to take the place of a traditional Victorian husband, in spite of the fact that she was a queen. And it's also very clear from his letters that he was trying to instruct her and to mould her as a person. Albert often found fault with Victoria's character, and she would normally write in a sort of more submissive tone really, you know, say, apologising for her faults, apologising if she, she'd been angry, and really asking for instruction. Her strong feelings for Albert meant that she knew she wanted to spend her life with him, but tradition dictated that no one could propose to a reigning monarch. By this time, Victoria was now queen, which meant that Albert wasn't allowed to propose to Victoria. Victoria had then decided to propose to Albert, in which the immediate response was a very happy yes. She writes ecstatically in her journal, never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert, his excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. On 10th February, 1840, Queen Victoria married Albert. The ceremony took place at the Chapel Royal, St. James's Palace in London. Victoria arrived to her wedding as part of a carriage procession, whilst Albert was escorted by a group of his senior cavalry. Victoria's favorite uncle, Prince Augustus Frederick, the Duke of Sussex, had given Victoria away, as her father had died when she was just a child. When the ceremony ended, the newly wedded couple in the carriage procession traveled to the Queen's home in Windsor Castle. Victoria was not keen to marry. She liked her freedom as a young queen. She liked the fact that suddenly nobody was telling her what to do. When Lord Melbourne actually suggested that she should marry someone, she actually said that was a shocking suggestion. She therefore was quite half-hearted when she invited Albert to visit, but the moment she saw him, all of that changed. Um, in her diary, she records that Albert was beautiful. She was absolutely smitten with him. He was the most attractive man she'd ever seen. And within days, he had absolutely won her heart. As the queen, it was not thought proper that Albert should propose to her. So she actually had to um, take the plunge herself, which she found very nerve wracking. She summoned Albert to come to her, leaving him a message. And when he came to her, she sort of very shyly said, you know, shall we get married? And of course he accepted. The fact that it was Victoria who had to propose to Albert really was something that signaled the unusual nature of their relationship for the remainder of their marriage. Because of course, it's a patriarchal society. The husband was master in his own, own home, head of his family. But that wasn't really the case with Victoria and Albert. And all through their marriage, they would have to navigate just what her status as queen meant to her status as wife. The married life of Albert and Victoria was a happy one. However, it had undergone some struggles. Due to Victoria falling pregnant with her future children, her responsibilities as queen had time and time again forced her to step aside. This meant that Albert would be her knight in shining armor, but he seemed to take over enormously. Victoria was of course heartbroken. She admired her husband for assisting her, but she deeply resented being robbed of her powers as queen. There were terrible arguments, and Albert was terrified by Victoria's temper tantrums. He was reduced to putting notes under her door whilst Victoria stormed around the palace. Victoria and Albert would have a large family. They had nine children. 
Victoria was not a natural mother and in fact had been very much hoping that she wouldn't fall pregnant very quickly after their marriage. Of course, there were no reliable contraceptives in the period and within weeks of her wedding, she discovered she was pregnant. She was horrified. She in fact wrote to her and Albert's mutual grandmother complaining that it was spoiling all her happiness in her young married life even saying that if it was a nasty girl, she would drown it when it was born. And Victoria could often be quite outspoken in her correspondence. She disliked pregnancy. She disliked giving birth. And she wasn't very fond of babies. She actually said that they were frog-like at one time and doesn't seem to have been particularly keen to spend time with her babies. She didn't breastfeed. In fact, she would compare it to being an animal. Later, when her own daughter, Princess Alice, breastfed her own children, Victoria actually named a cow in the royal dairy, Princess Alice, after her daughter. Their marriage saw nine children between 1840 and 1857. Five girls, Vicky, Alice, Helena, Louise, and Beatrice, and four boys, Bertie, Alfred, Arthur, and Leopold. There are parts of motherhood that she hated, but amongst it all, pregnancy was at the very top. Victoria heavily disliked being pregnant, describing the experience in letters to her daughter as one of being like a dog or a cow. She was reported to having hallucinations and feared she was losing her mind. She would refer to pregnancy and maternity as an unhappy condition and the shadow side of life. Her pregnancies aside, Queen Victoria was extremely fond of her children. However, she was less involved with her children than her husband, Albert, who took an active interest in their children's lives. As their family grew, Victoria admitted later on that she would only check in on them once every three months. Albert was not only present at their births, but he also took an active role in their clothing, care, and education, calling for seven hours of rigorous study seven days a week for his sons. Albert imagined his large family as future examples of the monarchy and had therefore set out to contribute widely to their growth. Of course, this meant tough love. Albert had set out huge expectations for his children and therefore would often scold them for not exceeding the high bars in which their father had set for them. Although Victoria wasn't responsible for the daily raising of her children, she was a fond mother in her own way. She nicknamed her eldest daughter Pussy, and there are some lovely drawings that Victoria did of all her children which survive in the royal collection. Prince Albert was the more hands-on father, but Victoria certainly involved herself in raising her children and did build very strong relationships with them, particularly in adulthood. The one exception to that really is her son, her eldest son, Bertie, who will later become Edward VII, and there she had a very troubled relationship. She was highly critical of Bertie. She considered him to be very unattractive. She said he had no chin and he had unpleasant, bulbous eyes. And actually, when we look at pictures of Victorian and Bertie, they look very, very similar. The traits she was criticizing were traits that came from her and her side of the family. She was worried about his morality. She was worried that he wasn't as clever as his father. And the fact that Bertie was never able to live up to Victoria's ideal of Albert cast a, a shadow over their relationship for the rest of their lives. She was quite a self-centered person. For Victoria, the center of the world was her, and she expected her children to support her, particularly after the death of their father. But she did build loving relationships with her children, and certainly, they did love their mother in spite of some of the troubles that they had. Prince Albert died on December the 14th, 1861. Researchers say his death was due to a stomach disease. 
Following Albert's death, Victoria was absent and comes back to her diary in the new year of 1862, in which she writes, have been unable to write my journal since the day my beloved one left us. And with what a heavy, broken heart, I enter a new year without him. Victoria was deeply distraught and was famously wearing black for the remainder of her life. Her affectionate husband was the only man who truly stood by her, and this dug a hole in her heart up until her very death. She missed Albert dearly, to the extent in which his room was always kept as they had always been, with towels and linen brought in and changed daily, very much so as if he was still alive. Albert may have died, but his presence lived endlessly in Victoria's heart. Prince Albert's death in 1861 was a shock from which Queen Victoria never fully recovered. With Albert's death, Victoria was absolutely stunned. It was reported that at the moment he died, she just screamed. She was so shocked by his death. She was, of course, only in her early 40s. She had spent years being undermined by Albert, who wanted to take on the role of sovereign. And so she felt entirely lost, entirely at sea by Albert's death. She immediately retreated into mourning black, and she would never leave mourning. She wears black for the rest of her reign. And when we think about Queen Victoria, we think about this black-clad widow with her white widow's cap. She refused to fulfill her public duties as sovereign. She simply felt unable to go out in public with the death of Prince Albert. And in the decade after his death, this caused real problems because it felt to people in Britain as though the queen had just vanished. She had abandoned the nation. And there was a real growing rise in Republican sentiment. People were basically saying, if the queen won't fulfill her role, what is the point of having a monarch? So it was a very difficult time for the monarchy. And it was really only as Victoria started to emerge and as she emerges the elder queen with her jubilees because of course she has her golden and her diamond jubilees her popularity returns but it was a very difficult period for many years after Prince Albert's death. John Brown first met Albert in Victoria in 1848 when they first leased Balmoral Castle and where he worked as a ghillie. He served for Queen Victoria for over 18 years. He was always a friend to Victoria, but became even more supportive of Victoria after her husband's death. Victoria would treat him many times. She also created two medals for him, one being the Faithful Servant Medal and the other being a Devoted Service Medal. Over time, they started becoming increasingly close, and Victoria's children and ministers were not as accepting of the high regard she had for Brown. Rumors started circulating that there was more to this friendship, but Victoria would dismiss this as ill-natured gossip in the higher classes. When we think about Queen Victoria, we tend to think about Victoria and Albert, and we think about Albert as the great love of her life. But of course, she lived for 40 years after Albert's death, and she didn't just have one love of her life. There's one man in particular who very much filled the void that Albert left, and that is her Highland servant, John Brown. Victoria met John Brown at Balmoral, which was her Scottish residence and one of her favorite places. She loved to retreat there. She could be more herself there. She didn't have to be monarch. She didn't have to stand on ceremony. John Brown was far beneath her socially. He had been a servant since the early days at Balmoral when Prince Albert was alive. But after Albert's death, she became increasingly close to him. Very much so to the extent that they were rumored to be lovers there were even rumors of a secret marriage between them 
It's very difficult to get to the bottom of the relationship between Victoria and John Brown because so many of her papers were altered or even destroyed after her death by her children. We know that Princess Beatrice, her daughter, removed many references to John Brown from Victoria's journals, while her son Edward VII ordered letters to be destroyed that related to John Brown. There are certainly quite strong hints that they may well have been lovers, and we know that Victoria was very interested in men and enjoyed sex. So it it doesn't seem beyond the realms of possibility that she was indeed involved in a sexual relationship with John Brown. Certainly, there's just a hint. One of her physicians, for example, recorded in his journal that he entered a room and found um, Victoria and John Brown in quite an intimate position where they were sort of, he'd actually lifted his kilt and she then lifted her skirts to show where she'd hurt herself um, earlier in the day. It was John Brown who Victoria relied upon. Um, she was incredibly close to him, a very, very close relationship. Her children despised him. Partly they despised him because of his low rank, but also the fact that he was so close to the Queen. And the Queen would take his side. At one point, John Brown complained to Victoria that he was unable to go to bed until her son Bertie and his friends had stopped smoking and retired to bed themselves. Queen Victoria actually tried to impose a curfew, a bedtime for her adult son, which of course did not go down well. John Brown was as devoted to Victoria as she was to him, and he certainly helped bring her out of the darkest period of her mourning. He was very blunt with her. He would call her woman, he would speak his mind to her, and she seemed to really enjoy that. She was devastated when he died. And actually, when she herself died and was buried, she was buried with John Brown's um, photograph, a lock of his hair, and even his mother's wedding ring that he'd given her as a gift, which again just shows how devoted she was to this man, who really is the second love of her life. John Brown became afflicted with erysipelas, which crippled him to the point of not being able to attend to the queen in over 18 years as her servant. Sadly, this resulted in his death. Queen Victoria writes, He had no thought but for me, my welfare, my comfort, my safety, my happiness. Courageous, unselfish, totally disinterested, discreet to the highest degree, speaking the truth fearlessly and telling me what he thought and considered to be just and right, without flattery and without saying what would be pleasing if he did not think it right. The comfort of my daily life is gone. The void is terrible. The loss is irreparable. Victoria's long reign of 63 years, of course, saw conflicts. And when we think about war in the Victorian age, we primarily think about the Crimean War of the 1850s, and then the Boer War, which was the last conflict of the 19th century. The first international conflict during Victoria's reign was the Crimean War of 1853 to 1856. An alliance of the Ottoman Empire France, Britain, and Sardinia defeated the Russian Empire in a dispute over control of the Holy Land. During this war, several Westminster Hospital nurses were working with Florence Nightingale, the mother of modern nursing. My whole soul and heart are in the Crimea, wrote Queen Victoria in the midst of the Crimean War, 1853, to 1856. Queen Victoria took a keen interest on the welfare of the soldiers and had therefore created the Victoria Cross, which remains the highest award for fearlessness and bravery in the British Armed Forces. Crimean War erupted in the 1850s when Russia seeking to take advantage of the sick man of Europe, as they called the Ottoman Empire, attempted to annex some of the Ottoman or Turkish Empire's territories. 
It was a shock to the Russian Tsar when Britain and France entered into an alliance to aid the Ottomans. And the Ottomans, who are of course a Muslim country, and the British and the French then formed an alliance against the Russians. It was really the first modern war in any great sense. I mean, it's the first war with war reporting. Newspaper reporters went out to the front line and we have photographs of the Crimean War. It saw modern weaponry. It also saw modern nursing techniques. This is the conflict where Florence Nightingale, of course, goes to nurse. It was a very bloody, very difficult conflict. Britain and their allies were the victors. And Queen Victoria, although obviously distanced from the fighting, was very much involved. She'd been an opponent to going to war in the first place, but once war had broken out, she was very enthusiastic. She writes in her journals of seeing the troops. She was involved in the creation of the Victoria Cross, which was first awarded in 1857 to Crimean War veterans, and which was, of course, and is still awarded today for great valor. Um, the medals themselves were struck from the metal of a captured cannon from the Crimean War, and Victoria would give the medals herself attending the ceremony, and she found that very, very moving. Later came the Boer War in South Africa, 1899 to 1902. The Boers of South Africa had refused to grant political rights to non-Boer settlers. Most of these people were British. This resulted in a conflict fought between the British Empire and two Boer Republicans from 1899 to 1902. Queen Victoria wanted to applaud the bravery of soldiers in the Boer War. She therefore made eight scarves in green Berlin wool. These scarves were to be allocated to men who were voted by their comrades as most brave. We know such a lot about Queen Victoria because she very diligently kept a journal right up from her childhood until just before her death. And although it was quite heavily edited by her daughter Beatrice, it's a really great way of seeing inside her head, seeing what motivated her, what she thought, and also, of course, her correspondence and records that other people kept of Victoria. She is a fascinating character. She'd obviously had a very troubled childhood, which was coupled with the fact that she learned quite early on that she was actually likely to become Queen of Britain because no one officially told her. She actually discovered while looking in a history book that actually she was very likely to be the next, next monarch of Britain. So Victoria's childhood was, was troubled. And she then, of course, suddenly became queen and set about enjoying herself. But what we can really see, we can see a great deal of consistency in her character throughout her life, from reading her journals and from other accounts. There is no doubt that Victoria was incredibly self-centered. The world revolved around Victoria, which in a way, of course, it did. But she struggles very much with empathy. She struggles to understand that other people may have feelings too, because actually, the center of everything is Victoria. However, she was also very, very kind. And we see in her journal, her worrying about individuals that she'd met um, and worrying that they had enough money and worrying about charity. She also worries very much about her family and she sends a lot of advice and it could be quite cloying, but it's clear that she's devoted to them and that she loves them. And she also loves her people and we can see that she tried very hard to be a good monarch. When she became queen, she said, I will be good. And she tried very hard to live up to that throughout her reign. She's a domineering character. And of course, she's a queen in a world where women are supposed to be quite submissive. But she was quite a modern woman in many respects. She's a fascinating, complicated character. But at her heart, I think it's very difficult to remove the queen from the woman, because actually her queenship was just so central to her identity and who she became. Queen Victoria's isolated childhood had made her sure that she wanted to treat people with the freedom in which she always longed for. The moment she became queen, 
was the moment she was set free. From a young princess to a young queen, her reign was indeed one of a reign where the sun never set. <laughs>